we've spent some time showing limited examples of how concurrency is applied in the key Android components, right? So activities, services, content providers, broadcast receivers, and so on. We've, we spent some time showing that. But we really haven't talked a lot about why you would want to use concurrency in the first place. What is it good for? So the next two parts, next two videos, are going to talk about why you'd want to do this. And as you'll see, there's a number of different reasons for wanting to do this. One reason is to be able to leverage advances in commodity hardware and software. So not surprisingly, things keep getting better, faster, cheaper over time. And so one reason to use concurrency is to take advantage of all that stuff, because otherwise your solutions won't be as fast or responsive or as uh, well structured. So that's sort of uh, the key motivations here. As we've done before, we're going to use our download application as a running example to illustrate some of the key points. I'll show you some code here a little bit later from a variant of that. And you can always go and take a look if you want to to see how it's implemented by looking at some of the examples in the GitHub. OK, so let's start by talking about some of the motivations. I mentioned before this concept of leveraging advances. Well, if you take a look around over the past you know, 30 or 40 years, there's been an inexorable advance or improvement in hardware and software technologies to the point where a lot of things are now becoming commoditized. What, is, what, is commodi what does it mean to be commoditized? What does that mean when something is a commodity? Lawrence. Means you can use and trade it with other people or programs. So you know, why do we have coffee beans, right? What, what, what's the significance of coffee beans? Unless you're like a Starbucks snob, coffee snob, you know. They're pretty much interchangeable, right? If you get, for the most part, um, again, people who are really into coffee would probably argue about this. But, but in general, coffee beans are a commodity. You don't really care where they come from, whether they're grown in, you know, Colombia or Brazil or some, or Chile or wherever. You just want to get the beans. And so as a result, they're things that are relatively inexpensive. They don't differentiate much beyond price. The, another way to look at it is that the mar profits are driven to marginal levels, so you're just barely eking out a profit over what it costs you to grow it. So that's, that's kind of what a commodity is. Um, so let's talk about some commodities that we're familiar with now. One obvious commodity that's been around for a long time, kind of one of the classic commodities, is known as Moore's Law. And what does Moore's Law say? Does anybody remember what Moore's Law says? It's, it's actually a subtle thing, yeah. That's right. So the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every 18 months to two years. You know, so you can sort of quibble about it. But it is pretty amazing if you take a look uh, at how this has taken place over time. You can read more about Moore's Law here. Um, in the past, we used that to make things run faster, right, to get the clock speeds to go faster. But that seems to kind of have more or less topped out around, what, three gigahertz or so. I mean, it, you can probably go a little faster than that, but that's about what it is. What do people use uh, processors nowadays for? Or what, what do they use transistors for? All those transistors. Multi-core processors. Multi processors, right? <laughs> so multi-core processors basically give us the ability of, of being able to run multiple things concurrently on the hardware, because you actually have multiple CPUs, central processing units, that read and execute instructions literally at the same time, right? So that's, that's kind of a big deal. Um, it's getting hard these days to buy processors that aren't multi-core. Many phones are multi-core. It's amazing how much this stuff is here. You will, by the way, if you have a, does anybody here know if they have a multi-core machine for doing their Android development? So if, if you think you have one. OK, so you will discover there's a great thing. What's a great thing about having a multi-core machine when you're doing this, this current assignment, assignment 2A? What's the best thing about having a multi-core machine? And it's not that all the viruses can run in one, one core while you're doing your testing. <laughs> um, you'll discover the bugs in your program very quickly. Because in a multi-core machine, these different threads of control will actually physically run on different cores. And you'll get all kinds of weird errors. And things will turn red and green and blow up and stuff like that. And that's good, because that way you'll, you'll discover what the problems are. 
uh, if you only have a single core, sometimes it's harder to actually find out what is going wrong because the scheduling order tends to mask what's really going on. So the hardware is getting better, faster, cheaper. We got a lot of more cores at our disposal now, and especially when you start getting to desktops and, and server class machines, we're getting dozens of cores and hundreds of cores will be available in the not too distant future. So we're going to have a lot of cores. So not surprisingly, a lot of the underlying infrastructure software, the operating systems, the virtual machines, have also become multi-thread aware. So they're able to be multi-threaded. The operating systems that we use these days, like um, POSIX or Linux or Windows or VXWorks or whatever, those are all multi-thread uh, aware, take advantage of multi-cores. Virtual machines like Java, those are multi-thread aware. So everything's starting to take advantage of it in the infrastructure software. And then on top of the lower level infrastructure software, we have what we call middleware, which are basically just a funny name, you know, thinking about a layered stack. Middleware is the stuff that's in the middle between the lower level stuff, like the operating systems and the virtual machines, and the actual applications that happen to run at any given point in time. So examples of middleware would be things like web servers, like Apache, um, various kinds of communication middleware, like Corba or DDS or .NET or Spring, or all kinds of other things, Android that for that matter, uh, or the different layers of Android that are middleware, those things are also multi-thread aware. And they typically are implemented using a bunch of cool patterns, and you can read more about some of the patterns that are here. The long and the short of it is to do almost anything nowadays requires knowledge of concurrency. So it helps to have the kind of thing we're going to cover here and the experiences you're going to get in order to take advantage of all the hardware parallelism. There's some other things that we want to do with all these advances. We actually want to use them to make our lives better in certain ways. And so we're going to talk about three ways that lives get better. One is by increasing performance, and we'll take a look at that. And basically that, as we'll see, involves running things in parallel or decomposing big problems into smaller problems that you can run in parallel. Even if you're not able to take advantage of parallelism for various reasons, and we'll talk more about that, you can also make things more responsive so that you don't leave users with the impression that stuff is hanging even though you're not running in parallel. So responsiveness is another motivation. And then the third thing, which is often the most non-intuitive to a lot of people because of some other things I'll say along the way, you can also use concurrency to simplify program structure. And this is sometimes surprising to people because what they read when they hear that is they think it means your programs get simpler. And your programs actually may still be very complicated, but the idea is that the structure of the programs get easier. And we'll talk about that more. Does anybody know off the top of your head what it is about concurrency or multi-threading that allows your programs to be structured in a more simple way? What's, what's the single most important thing you get? Well, we'll, we'll you'll see in a second when we talk about it what it is. So the first slides are going to talk about performance and responsiveness, and then the next set of slides are going to talk about structure. All right, so let's talk about using concurrency to increase performance. So this is a huge motivation. If you go back in the, the distant past, the main reason people were using parallel computing for a long time was to make things run faster. So you wanted to be able to do some kind of simulation. You wanted to be able to do some kind of analysis, like big data. You wanted to be able to handle more concurrent users, et cetera. Those were the typical reasons historically where we want to be able to do that. Uh, by the way, does anybody know where this comes from? Oh, this, is this is Spinal Tap, right. Turning, turning things up to 11 to make them go, go uh, faster or be uh, more performant. So we can enhance performance via parallel processing. And there's really two pieces to this. One is to be able to perform computations simultaneously where those computations run on different physical pieces of hardware, like the different cores on a multi-core device. And so you can imagine having lots of stuff that, that might do this. Now, certain types of computations have the characteristic that's known as being embarrassingly parallel. Does anybody know what it means to be embarrassingly parallel? What's the key characteristic of embarrassingly parallel, other than it, it's kind of you know, red in the face all the time or whatever? <laughs> So embarrassingly parallel, pro Robbie, yeah? Easy to parallelize. Easy to parallelize. And, and what's the reason why it's easy to parallelize? Because it, it has very distinct parts that don't need to run at the same time. Like, don't, need, don't rely on one another. Right. So the key, the key essence with embarrassingly parallel 
computations are, they have little or no dependencies, so they can all run together. They can all run simultaneously without having to worry about coordinating and interacting with each other. And, and certain kinds of things are embarrassingly parallel. Other kinds of things are not. And we'll take a look at that later. So that's one set of things you can do to make stuff faster. Another set of things you can do, which is not unrelated, but it's a slight different twist to this, is you can take a big problem and you can break it up into lots of smaller problems and have those problems solved concurrently. And whether or not there's communication that takes place, oftentimes you can organize things so that communication only takes place at very stylized points during the execution sequence. So for example, if you're doing some kind of image rendering application where you've got to take an image and do some processing to it for various purposes, you can often break that up so different parts of the image are rendered by different threads which are mapped down to different processing elements or cores. So things, you know, you can render the entire image by breaking it up into smaller pieces. So figuring out how to partition uh, the problem, there's various algorithms for parallel computing, that's a big issue in that space as well. Android enables parallel processing in a couple of different ways. So one way it does it is by being able to overlap computation and communication via its concurrency mechanisms and frameworks. So, so what does that mean? Well, one thing that means is while it's in the process of doing operations that take a long time to run, like accessing a database on the phone or off the, off the phone, or downloading an image from a remote server, or waiting for user input, or, or whatever it happens to be doing, while it's doing the communication portions, talking to a disk, talking to a network, talk, and so on, it can have other things going on while those calls are blocked. And they can be blocked, and you can simplify the program structure by having things blocking. But while one thing is blocked, something else that's available to run can be running. And we'll talk a lot about the Android concurrency frameworks and how they enable that to so have long running stuff running in background threads and stuff that's able to interact with the user running in the user interface thread. So short duration stuff runs in the user interface thread. Long duration stuff runs in background threads. And you'll see a lot of that as we, as we talk about these different approaches. Here's a simple example from the context of our image download application. You can imagine having a bunch of threads that run in the background over here, uh, perhaps in a service or just perhaps in a, a pool of threads that are spawned somewhere. And these threads can be blocked downloading one or more images concurrently. And as they finish, they can go ahead and put the image into a queue that's processed by the single user interface thread to display the contents somehow. So short duration stuff, user interface thread, long duration stuff, background thread. That, by and large, is the most common way we're going to deal with concurrency in Android. And we'll see a bunch of stuff with the concurrency frameworks that do that. That, by the way, is by no means the only way to do this stuff in Android. There's also an interesting framework called RenderScript, which can be used to parallelize work across all the processors available on a device. The stuff that we just looked at, the, the Android concurrency frameworks, the async task framework and the hammer framework, which we're going to talk about later, those are largely for mapping things to multi-core uh, in general purpose processors, the stuff that you would get uh, you know, just by using say, an ARM chip or using an Intel chip or something like that. That's conventional processors. RenderScript allows you to do that, but it also allows you to go even further and use various uh, graphical processing units, GPUs, or even digital signal processors, DSPs. So this is a framework that gives you a more a flexible way of taking advantage of all the parallelism that's available on the platform. And it's written in a, in a scripting language called RenderScript. Um, to learn more about programming with GPUs and CPUs and so on, I highly recommend you take a look at this keynote address on, uh, by, by a guy named Herb Sutter, who is at Microsoft, and he's also the chairman of the C++ Standards Committee, I believe for the whole world, but maybe just at least for the United States. And he has a really good art, uh, keynote talk where he talks about a Microsoft technology called Accelerated Massive Parallelism, AMP. And what's really cool about it is he explains the differences between generic CPU-like processing and GPUs and, and DSPs. And he talks about where the world is going. And he talks about heterogeneous parallel computing on all kinds of devices, your laptop, your server, your phone, and so on. And he talks about ways of programming against that. And there's a really, really cool demo 
occurs about halfway through his talk. That's just amazing to show you the speed up you can get by harnessing all the available parallelism on a, on a device. Typically, uh, this kind of stuff would be used for you know, image processing, computational photography, computer vis vision. If you're building those kinds of applications in the context of Android, like you're doing some kind of augmented reality um, service, then you might want to use RenderScript. We're not actually going to talk about RenderScript, but I just want you to be aware that there's a number of different ways to harness the available parallelism on an Android platform. Okay, so it's great. You may have all these cores, you might have all these GPUs and DSPs and so on, but oftentimes not everything that you do is able to take advantage of parallelism. Uh, if for no other reason that you might be stuck with a Droid 2 that probably has an old processor, probably got one older processor, and it's only going to be able to do one thing at a time. It's not going to be able to do the multi-core concurrent kind of stuff. And so you can't actually leverage that stuff. Uh, so that's one issue. You may not have the hardware. The second issue, even if you have the hardware, you may run into some constraints that make it hard to leverage the hardware effectively. So one of the problems might be that you've got legacy code that isn't thread safe. So a lot of older code was not written with concurrency or multi-threading or parallel computing in mind. It was just written to do one set of things at a time, and that was all it did. That's very, very, very common. Most people who haven't gone to school in the last five years or so have written code like that for a long time throughout their careers. In fact, a lot of the Android user interface toolkit stuff, in fact, all the Android interface toolkit stuff, is intentionally not thread safe. So various things like uh, you know, menus and um, UI controls and all this other good stuff, views and so on, all the things you get when you start doing interface programming with the user, that is not allowed to run in anything other than the user interface thread. You guys remember why that is, what the reason is that they, they don't allow that? We, we talked about that early in the class. Robbie. Uh, because in order to make it thread safe, they're required like locks and things that uh, use kind of computational devices. So they want to make it as fast as Yep. So one, one reason is overhead. So they have the old issue that we'll talk about here in a second about um, application not responding. That's another one. Lawrence? So since the UI thread is the only one that's allowed to actually access the main view and window, why would you want to have a GUI running that's not in a viewable window? So, right, so you, you can't have other things besides what's actually going to display stuff on the, the surface flinger and so on. Colin, did you have anything else? Okay. The other reason, of course, is, uh, and this, this is where the simplify program the structure comes in that we'll talk about you would also end up with a very complicated program structure in addition to perhaps being less efficient because you'd have to make sure that every time you wanted to access the GUI operations or GUI components, you had to acquire locks in your code, which would get very, very tedious and error prone to do. So those are some of the reasons why that. Oh, by the way, do you know who this guy is? Riff Van Winkle, right? So he's been asleep for a long time. He's legacy. He's a legacy guy. Probably still programs in... Uh, in ADA or COBOL, that's right. Actually, he's, he's making a great living as a COBOL programmer because everybody has retired except for him, right? The second reason why we might not be able to leverage all the parallelism available is known as Amdahl's Law or Amdahl's Law. Does anybody remember what Amdahl's Law says? Not to be confused with Amway's Law. That's a different law. Yeah, Colin. Is that where you get diminishing returns on performance improvements that only target a specific thing? You're, you're very close. That's, that's, that's the right thing. Did, Robbie, do you want to add anything to that? So something I remember from uh, operating systems was that, so like the diminishing returns, but um, it's only a linear speed up, and then you have to do all the overhead that comes with making it thread safe. So in the end, you're not really getting that So there's definitely overhead. That's another piece of it. Basically, what he says is, if your program fundamentally does not lend itself to being run concurrently, if there's sequential processing, this comes back to what we talked about before, the opposite of embarrassingly parallel is highly dependency constrained code. And if you have highly dependency constrained code, then you're only going to be able to get speed up by throwing parallel processors at the problem if you can find ways to make the code run faster by breaking things up and making them parallel. So it's, it's basically a diminishing returns argument. If, if your program or your domain doesn't lend itself to parallelism, then parallelism isn't going to help 
your application. Now, of course, if you have multiple things going on on your machine, it can still be a win. But for any given program, you can only speed things up so, so much. OK, so that's, that's sort of the issue here. Though those are the, that's the starting point. Well, even if you don't have the ability to make things run faster, the magic of concurrent processing may give you the perception that things are actually more responsive than they would otherwise be. So there's lots and lots of examples. You guys probably don't even remember this, but back in the early days of Windows or Apple, they used to have these funny little icons that would come up. I think I have one here. This is, this is the thing. If you started a long-running computation on your Mac, your older versions of the Mac, or your older versions of Windows, and it was causing stuff to take a while to run, this little hourglass would show up, which was better than getting the blue screen of death, but it basically meant that your program was blocked. And sometimes it, it didn't ever came back, so then you would end up having to reboot. Other times you just had to sit there idly waiting for it to finish. What was going on there? The whole thing was single threaded, and so if a program, a, a piece of code, took a while to run, everything else ground to a halt, which gave people this perception that everything was going really slowly. Um, now, nowadays, what you can do is you can actually have some stuff continue to be responsive even if you're blocked on other things. And we'll, we'll come back and talk about that. But the, the basic idea is using concurrency to avoid giving users the impression that something is taking a long time, even when it is taking a long time. So I'll give you another example you're probably familiar with. When you go to the ATM machine and you, you know, put your card in and you type in your PIN number and you select various things, what's really kind of going on there is it's checking in the background to see if you're authorized to to access whatever it is you're trying to do, but it's still giving you something to keep yourself busy while it's figuring this out. So it's, an, it's a perceived response to this. There's still maybe a remote procedure call or some kind of inter-process communication from the ATM back to some place that checks your, your card and makes sure it isn't stolen and makes sure your account balance is what it is, blah, blah, blah. But you're led through a series of menus that gives you this appearance that something is actually going on um, and you're having responsiveness from the, the system. Uh, by the way, the other day I had to call the IRS for various reasons. And they have this ridiculous labyrinth of voicemail or voice activated menus that you have to go through to get to wherever you're going. And you know, the whole thing is they don't have to have as many operators sitting around because you know, some people get fed up and hang up 10 minutes into this, you know, press number three if you want to do this, that, and the other thing. And whatever happens, you know, they're just basically buying time to delay you to get to somebody to talk to. So that's another example. I'm not sure whether you actually feel better about yourself by the time you're done. <laughs> I know you don't feel better about the IRS by the time you're done. You may not feel better about yourself. But the point is, it, perceived response time can be improved even if things don't actually run any faster, which is kind of an interesting thing. And Android defines a bunch of features and idioms, which we'll talk more about, for making things appear more responsive. So we'll talk in a bit more about this. In a nutshell, the user interface thread can interact with the user while longer running threads run in the background without interfering. 